Welcome to Calvary Chapel. If you've got your Bibles, would you open to the book of Matthew chapter 2? And while we're doing that, is anybody here for the first time? We'd like to welcome you. Raise your hand. God bless you. God bless you. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Now, um, we're glad that you're here. What we do here on Sunday mornings and Thursdays is we teach through the Bible. And we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 2, being it's Christmas time. And um, as you can see, I have the three wise men to my right here. And um, we're going to look at chapter 2 this morning, which is the chapter that speaks to these wise men. But I want, I've entitled the message, Finding Jesus. Finding Jesus. And let's pray one more time. Lord, help us as we look at chapter 2 to find you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So there's a search going on. In chapter 2, search going on. The most important search that a person can have, can have in their whole existence right here is found in chapter 2 in the book of Matthew. The idea of finding Jesus. Now, I would surmise that probably most of you have found Jesus in the sense that you have come to Christ and have salvation. There's that finding Jesus uh, whenever that takes place. So the search, if you can remember back, the search that, that went on in your life, um, there's that. But it doesn't end when you come to know him. When you come and pray and ask Christ to come into your life and you become born again, that's not the end of finding Jesus. And then it becomes a lifelong endeavor of coming to know him and finding him, you could say, in each situation of your life. And, um, and it's coming to know him. Well, we want to look, just look at this this morning. Um, there's going to be two entities that are going to be here that are seeking to find Jesus this morning in, in chapter 2. One would be what's called the wise men. And then this guy called Herod. He's seeking to find Jesus very frantically. All right. Those are two different entities. And you could say that they were on opposite ends of the spectrum. And, um, and there will be people in life that fall in between that spectrum somewhere in this idea of finding Jesus. But let's just, let's just dig in, in verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. So this idea, these wise men, the magi as they're called, um, and this is... Uh, a scene that you will see played out at Christmas time with Christmas cards. You'll see the wise men um, most of the time, pr pretty much all the time, almost all the time. You'll see them at the manger scene. Even our guys here, if you'll if you'll check them out, they're all designed to look down, and they're you know they're looking at the manger scene. Now uh, we'll see as we go through here. Things are a little different than they're depicted on the cards, and even in most nativity scenes, because again at the nativity, don't you have that they're one of the characters, three of the characters, and there's a star over the nativity scene. Probably most nativities have a star over them. And, um, but what we're looking here, what we're looking at here, actually happened at least a year later after Jesus was born. At least a year later, up to two years later, probably. We'll see that as we go through. So the wise men weren't at the manger scene. We'll see that as we go through. Um, they showed up about a year to two years later. But anyway, they're there, these wise men. From, they've come from the east. These guys are, um, the Magi were astronomers. They were guys that very much knew the stars. Um, the ancients knew actually a lot about the stars, but these guys were, were stargazers, and, um, and this is a big part of their lives. And so... Um, the Lord had shown them a star, and they were following the star. We'll pick it up in verse 2. Now, of course, on your search, if you're searching for Jesus, the first thing you would say is what they said in verse 2. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, we get to introduce to this idea that these wise men were following a star. Now, it's interesting because we just had a sighting of what's called the Christmas star, or the Bethlehem star, you were familiar with that, right? From the 21st through the 25th of December is a big deal. It's a big deal. Although the night that it was really supposed to be shown here, it was foggy. I mean, it was cloudy. I didn't see anything, right? But 
this, this was the two planets coming together, um, Jupiter and Saturn, right? Jupiter and Saturn, they, they were in a close orbit and one was behind the other. Two great lights came together and um, I had to get online and see, you know, some lady took some pictures down in Georgia and I got to see it that way. But, but you could actually see the two planets when they lined up, there's a great light. Now, what was so big about that? Apparently that hasn't happened at night. Now it happened during the day 400 years ago. I wasn't there, but then before that, 800 years, that's a big deal. It hasn't happened at night for 800 years. Doesn't it make you feel special somehow, right? But okay, my thinking is, well, what about before that, you know? Well, apparently, according to Pastor Chuck Smith in his commentary, he says it happened about 6, a, 6 AD that the star um, was, that same thing happened, those two alignments happened. Now, why am I saying all this? Because some people try to figure out what was that star? By the way, there's a good, uh, you can get a good video on that or online, you can see it. Uh, the Bethlehem Star, the Star of Bethlehem was called. We showed it here at the church several years ago. It's pretty fascinating. This guy had his own idea. He bought some, you, know, you can buy software nowadays, right, that can trace the stars, what they look, you, you plug in the year, and it'll take you back and show you what the skies look like. Fascinating stuff, right? In other words, the stars are predictable, right? That's how we know it happened 800 years ago, right? Or, or these things is predictable. Now, this particular star is not necessarily predictable in the sense that, because we'll, we'll look at how, how it acted. What I'm saying is my, my, my uh, take on it is that I don't believe it was Saturn and, and you know, two planets lining up. I don't, I don't believe in Jupiter lining up. I don't believe that. Because this star was very specific. You know, I, I get the chance, I was actually doing some stargazing this morning, believe it or not. I got up early, dark outside. I'm sitting in my study, and I've never done this before. So it was like this, I'm sitting there, I'm sitting in my study, praying, thinking through, you know, these guys following stars, and I'm looking out, oh, there's a, there's a, great, there's a star, but it's a big one. You know, I don't know, I don't even know what it was, to be honest with you. But I just know I was sitting there watching it. I have these windows that are, they're 32 panes of glass, you know, there, I guess it'd be called eight over eights, right? There's eight, eight, that's 16. And I got another window right next to it. They're connected eight and eight. So there's 32 little panes. These are hundred year old windows. So, that, so what I've got is basically graph paper looking out at the window. Think about that, right? You're looking through 32 panes of glass. So I'm looking at it and I'm, I'm watching, I'm just kind of looking at this star. I'm thinking, wow, look at that. And I'm thinking what it must've been like for these guys. Next thing I know, there's a telephone pole there and the star disappears behind the telephone poles. I'm looking at it. I'm going, huh, it's moving. It's not actually moving. We're moving, right? But there's movement. So I thought that was cool. So I'm watching. I thought, hey, and then I got the idea. I got a graph here. I'm just going to follow this thing through here. And it happened a lot faster than I thought it would, to be honest with you, because it didn't take very long for the get behind the telephone pole and come back out again. But what I'd noticed is it wasn't just traveling straight across. It was going up. You know, that, it was going up, you know, and I'm thinking, yeah, what about that star? You're following a star and it's going up, you know? How does that work if you're going to, I'm looking for Bethlehem and over a house, but anyway, I got to follow it and follow it through the graphs and it just kind of disappeared after a while. Uh, you know, it was a star. That's what, that's what pertains to this. I'm trying to figure it out with this star thing. And I would say to you, somehow, when it comes to this star, this particular star, um, I, I personally believe it was something that God did for these guys. That's what I believe. Now, it's just my personal belief. It doesn't change anything really about how I feel about Jesus or how I find the Christ. But I think it's interesting and pertinent when it comes to finding Christ. And I think if you'll think this through in your own life, the same thing happened to you or God did it with you on your quest to find Jesus, or maybe you're doing it now, you're going through that quest now, that he did with these guys. And here's what I mean. He used a star for them because they were acquainted with the stars. And so think back in, in your own life, the things that you're involved in, because God meets you right where you are. And it could be even bad things that you're involved in. He will somehow make a thing happen so that he draws you out of that somehow. But the point I'm trying to make is he connects us with us where we are, because it's more important to him that we find him. That's very important to him that we would find Christ. And the Bible says this about that, about this search about this journey that no man comes to the Father unless he draws them. So what I'm saying by that is that God's involved. 
You know that. Don't you remember back when you first came to Christ? The seemingly coincidences that were going on in your life, one thing after another. Man, it's exciting. You know, it's like, wow, things are, things are lining up. So much more than just two planets lining up. Everything was, these things are lining up. It was making sense. That, that's because you were searching for him. And the promises, by the way, in Jeremiah regarding searching for him, Jeremiah 29, 13 says this, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. What we're looking at in these wise men, this is what it looks like to be wholehearted. <laughs> they came a long way from where they were originated from. But they, they come and we'll watch, we'll follow these guys as they go through on, on their search. But the first thing they say is, and it's really practical, where is he? They show up in Jerusalem. The star had gotten them to Jerusalem. Where is he? Who is called King of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. They didn't really, seemingly, they didn't care. And we think about that. What do you mean? You showed up in town, you've been following a star? What kind of nut are you? Or, you know, they opened themselves up. We're here to worship him, this King of the Jews. They didn't really seemingly care what anybody thought. They were just open about their search, excited about their search. Well, verse 3 tells us this other person that was going to be searching for Jesus. Verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. First of all, we'll just cover the second part of that. All Jerusalem was troubled. Listen, when Herod was troubled, everybody around him was troubled. When he was having a bad day, everybody could have a bad day. It's said about Herod that his, you were better off to be his pig than you were his own children. This guy was so paranoid, um, um, fearful, paranoid, that's what that means, that he killed his own wife and his own children because he thought there was a plot going against him to take his throne. And he didn't, why that saying is, goes is his, 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 his pig, he didn't eat pork, so his pig was safer than his whole family was. That's what that, what that, what that meant. So the idea was, this guy was, um, some people believe, some historians that, that, that uh, study this guy believe he may have been demon-possessed even. He was that out there. But that being said, he was troubled. And it's, he was troubled because, you know why he was troubled? Because the term that they used for this king of the Jews, because Herod believed that he was the king of the Jews, and he had now a rival. This, this troubled him, this idea. So this troubled him, first of all, when he first heard about Jesus. He was troubled by this. And verse 4 says, And when he had gathered all the chief priests, that is Herod, and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Note that he's going to have a different, a totally different motive than the wise men had. The wise men, as they say, you know, some of the, some of the Christmas cards, wise men still seek him. That's a great line, right? Wise men still seek him. Well, Herod was seeking, going to seek him too, but for all the wrong reasons. They came and said, hey, we're here to worship. That's, why we're, that's our motive. We're here to find him so that we could worship him. And then Herod says he, he was troubled and he inquired of these, of these religious leaders that knew the scriptures. And so they said to him in verse 5, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, this is from Micah 5 too. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. That's Micah 5 2. And so I want you to see, and it's happening four times here in this chapter 2, which we're not going to get to all of them, but four times the scriptures are mentioned. The Old Testament scriptures are quoted in regards to. This idea of first chapter two, this search for Jesus. Um, this first scripture tells us that he will be born in Bethlehem. That's very clear. He was be born in, in Bethlehem. And here's what I would say to you regarding your search for Christ. You will find him like no other place in the, in the word of God. He is, the Bible says in John 1, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 of John 1 says, And the Word 
became flesh and dwelt among us. And you think of the idea of word. Word is, 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 word is something that we would use to, to express ourselves, words. We express ourselves with words. And so Jesus is the perfect expression of God, of God the Father. And so the idea, that's why he's called the word. Now, here's what I would say to you. But the point I'm trying to make is when you seek to find Jesus, find him, get it in your mind, in your heart that when I open my Bible, I'm going to find him in the word. I'm seeking to find him in the word. That is the motive. That's our motive for reading our Bibles. That should always be the case. Not just to find information, um, not just to find rules and regulations, which you will find all that in there, all of that. But I'm, when I read the word of God, I should be seeking to find Jesus, Old Testament and even in the New Testament. So they told Herod in verse 6 where he was to be born. Verse 7, then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. Now, two things are happening here. One in verse 7, we see the word secretly is introduced. Herod secretly goes to the wise men to talk to them. And we see the wise men, when they come into town, they're talking openly. Two different things. And it speaks to the motive um, that Herod had for, for the secretness. For the, to, and he says, and he sent them to Bethlehem, the wise men, and said, go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. That was an out and out lie. How do we know that? Because it tells us in verse 13 that at the end of verse 13, that he was seeking the young, the young child to destroy him. We have one group of people that were seeking Jesus to worship him. Now we got this other guy that's seeking Jesus to destroy him. There are many that believe that um, Jesus is going to be a hindrance to their life. He's going to take away their fun. He's going to make their life miserable. Um, and that is a lie that, this, that Satan tells people. And some people believe that, that lie. That, you know, believing in Jesus, knowing him, it's restrictive and everything else. And, and it's not worth doing because, you know, after all, you're not going to enjoy your life like you would if you didn't have him part of your life. And that is the lie that the enemy has been telling people. And, you know, Herod was believing that to, to the umpteenth degree. And, and one of the things that I think about when I think about what God did here with these men from the East, the, the wise men, you realize, because we'll find as we go on here, that the star led them directly to the house in Bethlehem. They went to Bethlehem, and then they saw the star along the way. And oh, they were happy again, because there's the star. And it says it landed right over the house, the star. All right? And here's what I want to say to you. God could have done that and, and totally bypassed Jerusalem, right? He could have done that. No, he had him stop in Jerusalem. I believe at least he was trying to reach Herod again. See, he's drawing everybody. He's, here comes these wise men. They're all excited about finding Jesus. They show up in town, and, and, and he even gets wind of it. Another opportunity for Herod probably wasn't his, his only one. You remember when you came to Christ, how many different times did you see that God tried to reach out to you and everything else? And I believe that's exactly what he was doing. He didn't need to stop these guys in Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, you could make an argument for, look what happened as a result of that. Because we, we go down and we see that the children, the male children two years and under were killed by Herod because he got wind that this Christ had been born. You follow me? So someone make an argument, well, if they wouldn't have done that, if they wouldn't have gone there and spoken, you know, and on and on and on, like, um, why does God? I would say to you, whenever you ask the question, why does God? Keep in mind that God does things. He's, he's seeking to give people all the opportunities that they can, pro they can possibly get to know God, to know who he is. I want to read to you um, proof of this from Acts chapter 17. This gives us some insights, a lot of insight. I don't know if you know this about yourself or not, but I'm going to read it to you. Acts ch chapter 17, verse 26. This is, take, this is a time when the Apostle Paul 
is at the Oropicus, um, and he's walking through, and he's looking at all these, all these different um, um, statues and such, these, these worship places where people can worship, right? And they're all false gods, and, and, he, and, he, and he gets this idea in his mind, oh, I see you have, you're very religious people. I want to tell you about the, 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 one, the one temple you don't have here. Uh, it's the unknown God. Or, no, I'm sorry, I'm going to tell you about the one you said. The, there's one to the unknown God. I want to tell you about him. You don't know him. So he, he's not going to tell them about this God. Now, I just want to read this to you, starting in verse uh, 26. Um, he has made this God. He has made from one blood every nation of men. That means this, that there's only one race truly in God's sight, the human race. He's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, now check this out, and has determined their pre-appointed times. That means this, that everybody that's ever been born was born in a certain, at a certain time. You know, that was their time, let's say. It wasn't random. It was pre-appointed that every human being would be born in the place. Um, I remember thinking back, and some of you can't go back here, but I remember thinking uh, when I grew up, was going, oh, it would have been so cool to live back in the live back in the fifties, you know, and all this stuff. Or maybe you think it would have been so cool to live in Jesus's day, right? It would have been, no, for you that would would have been cool. What's cool for you is to be right where you are. Let's go on. In other words, your times have been pre-appointed. Not just the day that you're born, the day that you die. Pre-appointed. Now listen to this. Not only that, not only the times, but the place. The boundaries of your dwelling. The boundaries of your dwellings. That means that not, you were not born wherever you were born by mistake. It was all by design. There was a purpose for that. We're getting to that purpose in a moment, okay? We're going to get to that purpose right now. But so not only were your times pre-appointed, um, but, your, but your boundaries of your dwellings, where you would be born, where you would live. And here's the reason, verse 27. In other words, God has done all this so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And what that says to, to us, to you and to me, is that God has done everything he could possibly do. And he is still doing it in people's lives. And even after you come to Christ, he's doing everything he can do to get your attention. When you start drifting off, he'll, he'll grab your attention. The point is, he's, he's set the table for us. And the, and the reason he's done all this is so that we could find, we could grope for him and find him. But I like what it says, though he is not far from each one of us. He's not far. He's not far at all. He's near, but he wants to be near. It says in James, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. That's the promise that, that we have. Well, these wise men had been drawn by God and they were excited about it. They were, they were, they were looking for him to, to worship him. And, and of course, Herod, and like I said, Herod um, was a very powerful man. And I believe God had them come through Jerusalem at that time to give him an opportunity to find the Christ in his heart and for the right reasons. Um, so he sent them to Bethlehem and it says... Um, when they departed, verse 9, when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Very specific. All right. That would be very specific. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Now, I would say to you in verse 10, that joy wasn't just about finding the star. I don't know if you remember this or not. There were times, uh, I'm thinking, I'm reminiscing about times when God was drawing me for the first time. And, and even I had a second time in my own life. It was a long story. I won't go into it. But, but 
there was a time that came when, um, and I, I liken this to when they, they obviously had the star going, then they, then they, then they weren't seeing the star <laughs> for some reason, right? They weren't seeing the star, and now they see it again, they're all excited. I would say to you that it goes beyond just finding the star. In other words, the, the root of the excitement wasn't the star itself. It was where the star was leading, you see? That's what the excitement was all about, where the star was leading. And the idea of seeing God's hand and because that's what that was to them. It was seeing God's hand. I'm, I'm reminded of a time, and I don't have all the details down, but when we had the, the, had the, the um, hurricane down south, um, the one that was in, you know, around Mississippi, Biloxi, Mississippi, it's been several years back. I don't, Katrina, thank you. We went down there with a the, with the team, and you know, there, it was, there was no cell phone service, there weren't even any street signs, okay? So to find your way around, and we didn't have GPSs at that, like they are now, okay? The GPSs where you could, you could buy one or two, they were like 800 bucks for one of these, G, you know, these big old th GPSs. So we didn't, I didn't have one of those things, but the point is to find your way around wasn't easy, let alone to, but we just felt compelled to go down there with a team. We believed the Lord was leading us to go. Well, we were, we were, self-contained we had a motor home we were self-contained we had everything we need to live so we didn't have to be worried somebody else take care of us so that was a good thing but we went down there and i got to tell you god we didn't even know where we were going it was sort of like you know go to a place so i will show you you know or something it was like that and we get down there and not only and um we prayed we had great times of prayer together in that motor home and and um and as we saw the devastation and we're like down there, Lord, what do you want us to do while we're here? Where do we go? We ended up, and I, I can't remember all the details, but we ended up to, at this place through word of mouth. And uh, we knew nobody down there. No church. We didn't know anybody at the churches and Calvary's down there. And like I said, everything was devastated, but we, we got hooked up with somebody said, oh yeah, go to the edge of town. We think there's something going on over there. So we, we drove around edge of town. We drove around because there's no street signs. And we drove around, and we found this place, and lo and behold, there was a place there that a man had started. He commandeered, he commandeered a, a, a refrigerated truck, had food in it, and he set up, the, or the, he didn't commandeer it, the, the mayor did of the town, and they started cooking just food for everybody there every day. And lo and behold, before we got there, there was a Calvary Chapel that had gone there and had set up a camp there. It was a Calvary Chapel camp. We had no clue that they were there, okay? And so we get there, and it was just an amazing, God had connected these dots. And my point is, is that we weren't just excited. It was because we saw God's hand in it. And so when, when I say to you, finding Jesus, that's what I mean, because it wasn't just exciting that we found this camp. Oh, now we have something to do. It was, no, God, we found him in that. We saw his hand in it. We need that in our lives, in our walk with the Lord to encourage us along the way. I mean, this God that we're serving, we can't see him with our eyes. It's a faith thing, right? That's, that's, that increases our faith, this idea of finding, finding God. So what I'm saying is that idea of the star, when it showed back up, they were rejoicing because they saw the Lord in that, in the star. They realized by this time that God was involved in the stars. And by the way, if you didn't know this, in Psalm 19.1, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Amen. The heavens declare the glory of God. In other words, he put the stars, even the, the things at night, the stars, the moon, the sun, everything he put in orbit, all, this, all these uh, planets, that it would declare the glory of God, right? It speaks to this idea of the Lord. So it's biblical, the thing that they were doing. So let's get back um, Let's get back to our story here. So it took them right to the right, the right place. And they, they were joyful. Verse 10, verse 11 says, And when they had come into the house, check that out, the house. That's different than the manger scene, right? Remember, there was no room at the inn, right? They were out in the, in the manger scene. And, and now they're in a house, still in Bethlehem, a year, at least a year later. So it, I just want you to point out that it's a different scene than it was before. So it says that they, they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. 
fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So three gifts. That's why we get the three wise men. Each one figure, each one would have a gift, and that's probably three people. It could have been three, but they, cut, they wouldn't have been three men by themselves, like the three amigos or something like that. These guys would have had an entourage with them, traveling with them, a whole bunch of people at least. And so we don't know how many they were, but we know they had three gifts. A lot has been said about these gifts. I will, I will just say this to you. I, I, you know, I see the practicalness in here, but gold, they said, was for a king frankincense for a priest who Jesus is, right? They used, and then myrrh for, it's a burial spice. It spoke to his future, what he came for. And I think those are, those are good things to say, but I want to say something else to you. Not too long, let's just go down. We'll read, the, I'll show you the practical aspect of this, but I see gold for a king, frankincense for a priest who is, Jesus was both a king and a priest, and, and myrrh, the burial spice, because he was going to be killed for our sins. He died for our sins. Then it says, verse 12, look at this. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. God divinely intervened. God spoke to them um, because he wanted to thwart the plans of Herod. And this is the bottom line to all this. Why does God? You know, when we think of anything, whether it's COVID-19 or who's going to be the next president or, you know, all these things are, are talked about in, in the word of God. It's, it's God who's in control of the universe. He's still in control of the universe. He's working. Um, we see it as behind the scenes, you could say. But he got word to these wise men. Don't go back and tell Herod where the kid is, where Jesus is. Don't go back and tell him. But I want you just to go on a little bit more. But when they had departed, verse 13, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph now, right? Appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. And there was until the death of Herod, and, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. So again, another reference to, to the word of God. But what I want us to see here is that, is that God is very much still in control. God is very much in and we see the protection for his his son. But I, I think we'll see this maybe when we get to be before the Lord, we'll see the way that He protects us. Sometimes in our own lives, you know, um, we can see it. I think more times than not, we don't get to see that. Like, for example, my wife and I always, my wife always, we encourage each other in, in this way. Like, have you ever been in a traffic jam or you've ever been in a situation? Yeah, traffic jam. That's a good one. For a long time. We always say, you know, you want to get upset about that? Should have taken a different way, you know, this and that. And, and you can, but we always come up with the idea, well, maybe the Lord's protecting us from something. That's seeing Him. That is finding Jesus in the moment. You see what I'm saying? He's in control, um, and we need to, to train ourselves even to find Him in that, in that moment, in that thing that may not be comfortable, that may not be the way that you think it should be, um, but He's doing something. And... Uh, and we just need to trust him in that. So finding him is, is trusting him in a situation. So we see that Joseph took heed. He went, to, he went, to, he went down to Egypt and, um, and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled. Now, the, um, verse 16 says, Now, then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, he spent a lot of time being angry. And he sent forth and, and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was, filled what was, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. But I want you to see in verse 19, 
And this is a sad thing, that now when Herod was dead, there's going to be no one on Judgment Day. And there is a day coming, the Judgment Day. It's called the White Throne Judgment, where everyone who has died, didn't know Christ, is going to stand. It's going to be the final judgment, actually. And they're going to be standing before God, and he's going to, um, they're going to pronounce, he's going to pronounce judgment on them. And probably Herod, I, I don't know all the details of Herod, but probably Herod will be in that line of people. And a lot of other people that rejected Christ, that rejected the, the drawing of, of God to, in their lives to push. And I, I believe there's a part that you have to push hard. You have to work hard to push God away. And he's done, like I said, he did that for Herod. He made Herod right at the place, at the time he was to be born, at the place he was to live, you know, and, and the wise men came through and were seeking. You see what I'm saying? He got to see a lot right there in Jerusalem where it all started. He got to see a lot, um, Herod did. And the sad thing was that he ended up dying, not finding Jesus, you could say. Um, and then it says, after he died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in, in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Interesting to me, right? You think, I mean, I think a thing, I don't know if you think like this, but God could take anybody out at any time. He could just, their heart could stop, just like that. And, and yet, he didn't do that with Herod. You know, he, he, as wicked as this guy was, is the harm that he caused people and everything else. Um, and, and you know this, and we, if you ever ask the question, why God? Because he's long-suffering even to the people that you would say are monsters. They're going to stand before the white throne judgment, and he's going to say, look at all I did for you. I, I, I had the wise men come through Jerusalem for you. They were right there. They were, they were all excited, and, and, and who knows how much else was, you know, how many other chances that he had to do this. And he'll be without excuse, like everybody else that rejected Jesus Christ, that that uh, resisted, I guess, finding him. Because you have to resist finding Jesus. Verse 21 says, Then he arose, took the young child, Joseph did, and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. Two things happen there, by the way, in the finding Jesus or finding God. You know, there's fear that's unfounded, right? But then there's a lack of peace, you could say, and then it's when it's confirmed by God. That's important for us. That's all we need to be in the Word. The confirmation comes. But So Joseph was, now he didn't have a peace because this guy was just as wicked as, as Herod, let's say the son, and the Lord, the Lord said, he confirmed it, and he said, um, he, in a, through a dream, he said, turn aside and go into the region of Galilee. Verse 23 says, and he came, and he dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. So that was God's will the whole time. That was the, that's what had to be fulfilled, that they would live in Nazareth and not in Jerusalem. So that's how God worked it out. God is working everything. He's got it all worked out. Anybody wondering about the, you know, you know, or worried and concerned about the election and, and uh, what's going to happen to this country? What are we going to be facing? This and that and the other. Um, hey, I, I don't know the answer to those things, but here's what I do know. I do know that there is one who has all the answers, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And I would say to you, what can we do? I mean, you know, what, what do we do? Here's what we do. We keep seeking after the Lord. We keep finding Jesus in this process, all right? He's in it. Believe me, he is in it. And he's working so many things. He's multifaceted, working on all kinds. You know the biggest thing that's happening in our midst with all the things we're seeing politically? People need to know Christ. That's what it's all about. Not, you know, it's... We prayed for truth to come to the light. You know what's more important than finding out who 
who, if, if an uh, uh, election was rigged or not, people coming to know Jesus, that he's the Savior, that's the most important thing. Amen. I mean, the other truth is important to God, but Jesus is the truth. He is the truth. And the most important thing is that you find him. That you find him. So we have some, at least three guys, or at least two guys, possibly more wise men. They found him that day. They worshiped him. And their life now is put in the, in, in the right place. They had found Jesus. And that was just the beginning of their lives. And they ended up going back to where they, where they were. And their lives, I'm sure, were never the same. Though we don't hear anymore about these guys. I'm sure their lives were never the same because when you, have, when you worship Him, when you meet Christ and you worship Him, your life will never be the same. And of course, conversely, on the other side of the coin is you got this guy, Herod, who had the interaction. It's where, it's where Christianity all started, right there. He was born right at the right time. He could never say, oh, I wish I would have lived in the days of Jesus. He did. He was right there. And he could have, you know, the story could have been so different. It was the choice that he made. And so it's important that we, you know, as we think about the wise men and their wise choices of finding Jesus, that first of all, you don't leave this place today have you found Christ? I mean, are you saved? Have you asked Jesus Christ to come into your life and save you of your sins, save you from your sins? That's what he came to the planet for. That baby grew up. He grew up, he lived the perfect life, and he went to the cross um, to die for your sins, for my sins. And he was buried, and then he rose from the dead three days later, and he ascended after a period of time, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And by that, I mean he's alive and well. And he is the Savior. The question is, is he your Savior? The cross really happened some 2,000 years ago. But a person, to be saved, must appropriate the cross. And by that I mean you must receive Christ. You must ask him, invite him into your heart. And, and if, if you're hearing this for the first time, or maybe, maybe the second time or the third time, He's knocking at the door of your heart and you need to make a decision to say no to Jesus Christ or to say like, oh, I'll put it off. You're saying no. There's the, the, he's, he loves you that much where he's, he's, brought you to this four, he's brought you to this place so that you can make this decision to receive Christ. I'm going to give you a chance to do that. Um, we're going to pray and give anyone a chance to receive Christ that maybe never has or maybe like me walked away. And, and are coming back. Um, but I'm going to pray a twofold prayer. One is for anyone that wants to receive Christ Jesus, and the second is for, for the church, for those of you that already know Jesus as Savior. And for this, this um, longing, that the, to have this longing to worship Him that the wise men have. This idea of wanting to seek Him. We well, say, well, I am seeking Him. I'm talking about seeking Him with a whole heart. And, and when I think of a whole heart, I, I'm thinking, can you ever really get there? And it seems like it's more of a pursuit or um, then and, and can, you, can anybody, I, mean, I can't say this, I'm actually, I'm, I'm wholehearted. I can't say that. And I don't know that I'll ever be able to say that on this side of heaven. Um, but I know that I want more. Let's put it that way. I want more of him. That's what I'm saying. And I'm going to pray that prayer for those of you that already know Christ Jesus as Savior, I'm going to pray that prayer for you. So let's pray together. First, a prayer for anyone that wants to receive Christ, and then a prayer for those that already know Him. Lord, thank You for Your Word this morning. Thank You that a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. And Lord, we want to pray for anyone who does not know Jesus. And this would be their finding Him right now, Lord. And, and, and this is a big eye-opening moment. If that's you today, if you want Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, come into your life and change your life forever. Save your soul so that you know you could be in heaven with Him someday. And, and not just heaven. We're talking about changing your life here on earth. You can, you can know Him. You'll, you'll, you'll 
be able to see him in circumstances. The Bible says to as many as received him, to those he gives the right to be the children of God. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now, a prayer of receiving Christ as your Savior. If you want Christ Jesus as your Savior, pray this prayer and God will hear you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Come into my heart right now, Lord. Take residence in my heart and mind. I want to turn my life over to you. I want you to lead me through this life. And I thank you for the gift of heaven when it's all over and this life is over. I just commit my heart to you as much as I'm able right now. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, for your church, help us in these last days not to be distracted, to be fearful, to um, buy into worry, um, and to be overly focused on earthly governments that come and go, but help us to be mindful of your kingdom, Lord, that will never end. And so we just commit your church to you. We commit your bride to you, that we would continually seek you, that we could find you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.